Okay, good evening. I think we are uh, now live streaming on YouTube also. Uh, so we are ready to go. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Rudrangshu Mukherjee for uh, making the time to be available here today. Uh, Professor Rudrangshu Mukherjee, as you all know, uh, is a noted historian, an author, an academic, currently Chancellor of the Ashoka University, uh, uh, streaming in uh, at this moment from uh, Calcutta. Uh, and uh, I'm Paul Abraham uh, from the Sarmaya Art Foundation uh, from Mumbai. Uh, this month, uh, we are uh, on Sarmaya, uh, covering uh, Bengal and uh, you know stories around Bengal uh, from the Bengal presidency. So I'd urge uh, all of you to go to our website and to our social media handles and read the many, many stories uh, on Bengal. And I thought uh, uh, today it would be most appropriate to have uh, Professor Mukherjee here with us uh, talk about uh, uh, Bengal and uh, the early nationalists and a little bit on either side because uh, the early nationalists typically are uh, uh, a period that covers from, you know, about the 1885s to the end of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the reunification of Bengal and the transfer of uh, the capital to Delhi, which was 1911. So uh, I think there are some in very interesting stories a little before and uh, after, and uh, we'll touch upon those, but uh, for the most part, we'll be talking about this period. And just to set the tone, uh, Bengal was uh, considered one of the most uh, wealthy provinces of uh, Hindustan. Uh, at one point, they had estimated that something like 12% of world GDP was from Bengal, uh, an incredibly rich state. And it got subsumed as one of the subhas or the provinces of the Mughal Empire and uh, was one of the most uh, uh, sought after uh, provinces. Uh, in fact, a lot of the most important uh, people of the Mughal pantheon were sent as governors of Bengal. And then, of course, uh, we had uh, 1757, the famous Battle of Plassey with the British uh, uh, you know, East India Company uh, defeating uh, the then Nawab of Bengal. And uh, uh, following that in 1764, a larger formation, which included the Nawab of Awad, Shah Alam II, uh, they got defeated at the hands of the British uh, forces again. And with that passed uh, the right to collect taxes into the East India Company's hands. So the Diwani for Bengal was handed off to the East India Company. And of course, uh, uh, there was a time uh, from around the 17, uh, the Battle of Buxar was 1764. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the English went about in right earnest collecting taxes and they were not the uh, most uh, kind of uh, uh, all collectors. And uh, very rapacious, very uh, uh, vicious in their collection processes and things like that and uh, we end up in a massive massive famine in the 1770s so uh, that kind of uh, you know started to some extent the uh, slide of bengal into more difficult times and thereafter of course uh, all the way up to 1943 many a event uh, pr uh, further famines plagues all of that happened but um, you know, when we talk of 19, late 19th century Bengal, what was the landscape there, Professor Mukherjee? Can you just paint us a picture of late 19th century Bengal? So I first want to clarify as a follow-up to the introduction that you just gave, that when we are talking about Bengal in the in Mughal times in the 18th century and right into the 19th century, pre-1905, we are not 
talking about this little strip of land that is now shown on the Indian map as West Bengal. What the Mughals called Suba Bangla and which is what the English East India Company took over, as you rightly said, after Plassey and then more importantly after Buxar, consisted of this little strip of land today called West Bengal, the whole of Bangladesh, the whole of Bihar, the whole of Urissa, and large parts of Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh. So this is a huge tract of territory, huge, really big tract of territory. Suba Bangla was one of the largest subas of the Mughal Empire. It was not only rich, as you rightly said, it was also physically very large and it was very densely populated. So this landscape, geographical landscape and administrative landscape doesn't change very much till 1905 when, when Curzon decides to partition Bengal into East and West Bengal. But before we come to that, the British also introduce another administrative innovation. They create after 1850, as their empire expands, they introduce three presidencies at, as administrative units. The Bombay presidency based of course in Bombay, covering the whole of Maharashtra, Malwa, Gujarat, uh, parts of the Karnataka, the Madras Presidency, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Guntur District, and so on, uh, the Madras Presidency, and again, the largest, the Bengal Presidency headquartered in Calcutta, which actually stretched right up to Delhi. The whole of Uttar Pradesh, Agra, etc., what was called the United Provinces of Agra and Aur, was part of the Bengal Presidency. One very interesting sidelight to this is that the three presidencies have presidency colleges named after the three metropolis. So Bombay Presidency College, Madras Presidency College, Calcutta Presidency College, which is now Presidency University. And I've often asked, why doesn't Delhi have a presidency college? It doesn't have a presidency college because it was part of the Bengal presidency. That's the, that was just, that's the simple answer. So yeah, that is yeah. another administrative um, innovation that the British, British make. And what has happened in Bengal, uh, one very famous historian called Bengal the British bridgehead. It was from Calcutta and Bengal that the British expanded their military and administrative and economic tentacles into the rest of India and certain, certainly into North India. And this gave Calcutta its central importance. It was the commercial and the political capital, the trading hub of the English East India Company and after the exit of the English East India Company, even for the crown as well. So one of the important things that happened because Bengal is the bridgehead is it receives the impact of some of the educational and social reforms. It is the first to receive the impact of educational and social reforms. So Western education, for example, comes to Bengal in around 1817 when the Hindu college is set up, which is nearly two decades earlier than the setting up of the Elphinstone College in Bombay. I'm taking the example of Bombay because you are in Bombay and many of our uh, listeners might be, in, might be Bombay based as well. So, so that's the time lag, nearly two decades. And also the social reforms, the milestone social legislations, modern social legislations that are carried out, abolition of sati, the introduction of the widow remarriage of, for Hindus, all these happen out of Calcutta because of campaigns carried out by Bengalis like Raja Ramon Roy and Ishwachandra Vidyasaka. And 
education flourishes. So Bengal has by the 1860s, 1870s, um, very flourishing, very vocal, very well educated, Western, ed, westernized literati. These are people that are very well versed in what has been taught to them in first Hindu college and then presidency college. And then after that in 1857, when the University of Calcutta is set up. So they are well versed in literature. They are well versed in Western political philosophy. They are well versed in um, political, political economy. Many of them have read Adam Smith and Ricardo. And so, but more importantly, they are in tune with what is happening in the West, the ideals of liberalism, John Stuart Mill, Jeremy Bentham, uh, the ideals of liberty, democracy, they, are, they have imbibed these ideas through the education that they have received in Hindu college and presidency college and in Calcutta University. But when they are coming out of the portals of these educational institutions and facing the reality of British ruled India. They are discovering that the reality does not match what they have actually been taught. There is no democracy in India, British rule in India for all practical purposes is a despotism. British rule has a exploitative presence in India, it is draining wealth as the phrase went from the late, from the 1880s onwards, but the phrase was coined by Dadabai Naroji, a Bombay person, that there yeah. is a drain yeah. of wealth happening from India to Britain, which is making India poor and Britain rich. And very importantly, if we are to understand how nationalism emerges, this Western educated intelligentsia begin to use their training, their education to look at India's past, a past that British administrators, British rulers, British bureaucrats like Thomas Babington Macaulay, James Mill, the man who wrote the history of British India, which was supposed to be the Bible for civil servants who are coming out to India from England. They all denigrated India's past. India had no history. James Mill went to the extent of declaring India had no history before the arrival of the British. The whole of the history of India could be written, Mill famously wrote, as a chapter of British history. So India has no history. And Macaulay ridiculed India's past uh, by saying that, you know, uh, the entire corpus of Indian learning, just imagine this, the, the claim, the arrogance of the statement, the entire corpus of Indian learning would not even fill one half of my bookshelves, right? So out of this denigration or to counter this denigration, to find out if this denigration has any validity, this sections of this Western educated intelligence here in Calcutta and then subsequently in Bombay and Madras as well, they begin to look into their past and they discover that exactly the opposite of what they were taught is true. Bengal not only has a history, it has a philosophical tradition, it has a literary tradition, it has a political tradition, and this is a tradition that can in no way be denigrated. In fact, it is a tradition for, of, for which Indians should be very, of which the Indians should be very proud. This is the beginning of a kind of an assertion and a self-confidence and an establishment of a kind of an identity that as Indians, we have nothing to be ashamed of and then we should assert our identity. This is the beginning, the seeds of nationalism, if you like. The idea of 
pride in one's sense of belonging to a geographical space. So this is what is happening. This is the churn, one of the churns that is happening in late 19th century India. But it's interesting that while the educated elite were building up in terms of their uh, sense of uh, nationalism and uh, their ability to question from the inside, there were other grassroots uh, movements that were happening which were already kind of objecting to British zamindar hegemony or say for example the case of the Santhal rebellion of no, much earlier than that Paul. It so British rule, British conquests rather, and I'm using the word plural, conquest, because the British didn't conquer India in one fell swoop. Yes. They conquered it region-wise. So there were a series of conquests all over India. Okay, so you have wars with Tipu Sultan, you have wars in the Kanata, you have wars, Anglo-Maratha wars and so on, Anglo-Sikh wars. So every region, when it was conquered, resisted British rule. And in Bengal, this resistance, as you said, occurs in the Battle of Baksa, because Mir Qasim, the Nawab of Bengal, who initiates the what you described as the triple entente, if you like, tripartite alliance between Mir Qasim, Shah Alam II and the Nawab of Awadh, Shuja Uddola, Mir Qasim is not alone in Bengal. Mir Qasim has already formed an alliance with the Zamindars of Bengal to oppose British rule. Hmm. Large sections of the Zamindars of Bengal to oppose British rule. So British rule is being opposed as distinct from modern style nationalism. Yeah. Opposition to British rule is occurring as soon as British rule is being established. For example, in, in North Bengal, there was a massive peasant uprising in 1783 led by a, a person who we have forgotten about, Devi Sinha. Mm, correct. Then you have the uprisings of the Kohl, the Santals, Birsa Munda. So, so the series of localized uprisings against the exploitative practices of British rule. Yeah. These are also happening side by side. These are parallel developments. There's some really interesting ones there, like Bashar Kela, there's Titumir, uh, who uh, in 1831, uh, and that's the time when the Zamindars and the British, uh, you know, got together to, you know, suppress. Yeah. Right? And that's interesting because at some point later, the Zamindars kind of move away. And that they are kind of bought over by the permanent settlement. The permanent settlement has this as the background. Yeah. The alliance with Mir Qasim is one of the backgrounds of the permanent settlement. Yeah. So it's interesting because also, uh, you know, at around that uh, late 19th century, there was a lot of, you know, nationalism that was also perpetuated through poetry, prose, literature, you know. And if you look at it today, modern India, some of the uh, poetry and the symbols that we take great pride in all emanated in those few years, right? With the oh, Vandai what I What I just described as the assertion of identity, the assertion of pride, the first articulation of that actually takes place through, as you rightly say, literature. Literature, theater, these are the two very important vehicles. By literature, I am including poetry, songs, essays, novels, the lot, the entire yeah. corpus of written texts, as well as theater. I mean, one shouldn't forget the, that, that very important play called Neil Darpan the Mirror of Indigo, which was written in 1865 by Dinamon Mumitro to actually expose the exploitation and the oppressions of the white indigo planters. And this created an enormous stir uh, when the book was translated into English, the publisher, Reverend James Long, 
actually was imprisoned because of uh, publishing that book. And his bail was paid by a very famous Bengali called Kali Prasanna Sinha and a very famous Bengali poet. In fact, the most important Bengali poet before Tagore was the translator of this text, Michael Modushudon Dutch. Yes. So this is happening. And of course, Bonkin's novels, particularly yeah. Anandamor, which incorporates the song Vande Mataram, which was originally written as a piece of poem and then was set to tune by none other than Rabindranath Tagore in the Rag Desh. And he sang it in the 1892 session of the Indian National Congress. But Tagore himself is a very important figure in this. As a young man, a lad, I would not even call him a man, a, 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 as a young man of 16, he is he wrote an essay extolling Rani of Jhansi, Lakshmi Bhai, as one of the earliest patriots and one of the earliest persons to oppose British rule. As only 16 years old, this is in my reckoning, and I have been researching 1857 now for well over 45 years, this is the first piece of writing in any Indian language by any Indian on any aspect of the revolt of 1857. Hmm. So certainly what you are saying, literature is becoming a very, very important vehicle for the articulation of these emerging nationalist sentiments. And these sentiments are catalyzed by Curzon's decision in 1904, which comes into effect on the 16th of October, 1905 partition day to bifurcate Bengal. Yeah, so I, it's interesting because uh, po poems like Amar Shumar, Amar Shunar Bangla uh, is written around that time, and today, it, interestingly, it's the it national is, anthem. It of is Bangla. written in. It is written exactly in 1905. Yeah, as a as a kind of uh, invocation of Bengal to protest against the division of Bengal. Yeah, right. So. Amar Shunar Bangla, Ami Tomai Bhalobashi, my golden Bengal, I love you. So it is an evocation of Bengal and also as an assertion of patriotism. Yeah. So even uh, the General Dal you know, Ray. Another theme that is emerging, and this is uh, this goes back to Bonkim's Anandamon, is the identification of Bengal and then by almost by transposition for the whole of India of with the with the mother yes the country is our mother so hence the notion of motherland correct another famous song of tagore it goes like this uh, oh, ma to my dekhe dekhe aankhi na fere. Oh, mother i look at you again and again every day but i can't turn my eyes away from you you are so gorgeous you are so beautiful even the, the, the general race is now Banga Amar, Janani Amar. Yes. Dhono yeah. Dhanne Pushpe Bhora. You know, another invocation, the general Rai of, of Bengal. You know, it is full then, of uh, prosperity. And, uh, so before 19... Uh, by the way, TM Krishna has an outstanding rendering. Those of you on the in the audience who haven't heard it, you should hear TM Krishna singing this the general Rai song. Uh, Amar Janmo Bhumi. Yeah. So tell me, is then 1885 and the kind of formal, you know, commencement of the Congress a turning point for all the people to kind of gather together, including some of the Bengali stalwarts? So what is happening, it is a pivotal moment, certainly, but I should just place a little bit of context here. What has been happening in these presidency towns, the three presidency towns, is that these sections of this intelligentsia are already organizing themselves into various bodies to articulate their grievances against British rule. So 
the British Land Holders, so Indian Land Holders Association, for example. So what are the grievances of landholders against British rule and so on? There are many, many associations like this. So the idea comes to a group of people mostly based in Bombay and in Calcutta that instead of having these divided sectoral voices of grievances and various different kinds of fora, why don't we try and form one national body which will articulate the interests of all Indians cutting across sectoral interests, all Indians. Mm -hmm. And they called that body Indian National Congress. And the 1885 meeting is in fact an experimental meeting. They don't quite know whether this will be a lasting thing, whether it will be possible to carry it on together. So they, they move it in, they hold it in Bombay. And this is a very interesting anecdote. Most of the people who are planning this or proposing this, that's a better word, of this kind of an all India body are Bengalis. But they don't want it to appear as if it's just a Bengali project. Yeah. So actually hold it in Bombay. That shows that it is trying to cross provincial boundaries. Yeah. They hold it in Bombay as a kind of experiment and when they find that there is a positive response in Bombay, it was held uh, for three days, Boxing Day, 27 uh, December and 28 December for three days. It was decided that from now on, it would be an annual affair. They would meet every year on those three days at different parts of in different at different in different parts of India. And the second meeting, the second congress, is actually held in Calcutta. Yes. So yeah. that's how it goes. So the and 1905 attempt. For the first time, India and Indians have a forum in which Indians are speaking for themselves. They are yeah. not speaking as a trading body, a landholding body, peasant body, and so on and so forth. There is a category that is being created, an identity that is being created called an Indian identity. And this Indian identity is speaking through the Indian National Congress. And what is the Indian National Congress's most important demand Right through till the Mole Minto reforms, the, and even later, that Indians should have some say in decision making. How India is to be ruled, Indians should have some say in this. They are still not challenging British rule. Yeah, they are not even saying the British should go away, but they are saying no. We want to be partners in this enterprise. Even if we are junior partners, doesn't matter. But allow us some space where we can also be party to how we, India should be ruled, how India can be ruled, and so on. So this is one of the principal demands of the Indian National Congress. Yeah. And again, so I must say, yeah. dramatically changes. With the partition, yes. So come 1905, cousin, you know, uses the age old trick of divide and rule in a sense. So the vast uh, Bengal presidency is divided down the middle. Uh, there's present day Bangladesh for the most part and uh, some parts of Assam. So there's an Eastern Bengal and a Western Bengal. Western Bengal. So Western Bengal is present day West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, the other side is present day Bangladesh and uh, some parts of Assam. So uh, this is another, you know, fundamental movement, uh, moment in time, literally. You know? So it creates a, an element of uh, uh, discord within the Congress because suddenly there is a bunch of people saying uh, the original bunch is somewhat pacifist and soft. We need to get a little more aggressive with the British. And it also, I think, sows the seed even though the formation of the Muslim League happened in Dhaka, but uh, no, was not initially the intent. 
it sows the seed for hindu muslim discord formally because it creates platforms so i i give a qualified response to that but before that i want to make this point that the public uh position of cousin and the british indian government was the province of bengal was too large to be governed as one unit mm -hmm. so it is administratively necessary to divide it this is the public position but this didn't fool the western educated intelligentsia they caught on immediately that this was not the real intention the real intention was to divide and rule the real intention was to create divisions between an emerging national movement and now the researches of historians have actually shown that this inference of the western educated intelligentsia in 1904-5 as things were happening they had no access to documents secret letters and things like that they were spot on now letters between curzon and the secretary of state lord amtill clearly show that this is what the bengal partition was about yeah. we want to nip indian nationalism in the bud and in the process also create a division between hindus and muslims so this one must get give credit to this intelligentsia that they couldn't be bluffed by cousin's rhetoric that's one to uh what emerges as the anti partition movement which now historians call the swadeshi movement because of a very important dimension of that movement which i'll come to in a minute has at least four strands to it these are overlapping strands it's not as if they are in open hostility they are all happening together simultaneously one is for the lack of a better term what is called the moderate position lobbying the government petitioning the government to withdraw plan partition okay Pre pressure tactics okay lobbying is the word to use that's the moderate position a second position that is emerging is this and this is where you are somewhat right that just petitioning will not do we must buttress the petitioning with some action on our part mm. which is visible to the government and to the public so what are those actions one meetings demonstrations strikes hartals partition day 16th october 1905 is a hartal day bengal observes a hartal day okay fourth this is the dimension i was talking about boycott boycott what boycott all british commodities yes so that's number four that that is that is happening these are and the fifth is very important a display of hindu muslim unity that hindus and muslims are one they are brothers and the attempt of the government to show this to throw discord into this we are going to fight it and the greatest gesture against this was the movement to tie rakhis even though it wasn't rakhi purnima yes. yes so the anti partitionist activi acti activists went around uh tying rakhis to everybody hindus and muslims irrespective of religion and and one of the great mobilizers of this kind of protest of unity of boycott uh, and so on demonstrations is also literature theater in which tagore plays a very very prominent part uh, when he was being nominated for the nobel prize uh, ezra pound was very famously to say 
Tagore sang Bengal into a nation. Mm. Okay? So, so that's the second strand. And the third strand coming out of this is again epitomized in the views of Tagore and in his activities that if India has to be strong, if India has to assert itself and India has to rebuild itself from the ruin that the British rule, that British rule is causing to India, India must develop from within. It ha there has to be an organic rebuilding. Mm. And that organic rebuilding must start in the rural world, in the villages. So village reconstruction becomes a very important form of activity in Tagore's own life and it spreads to other Swadeshi activists as well. Tagore calls this Atma Shakti, soul, strength of the soul, Atma soul. So Bengal, India must find strength within her own soul to develop itself. So this is another third strand that is emerging. And the fourth strand is as is a late entrant into the Swadeshi movement, 1907, 1908, as in fact, for various reasons, we can come to those reasons a little later, if you want, as they find that the other three strands are not as successful as was expected and no immediate results are forthcoming the fourth strand emerges, and this is the cult of the bomb. Yes. So the Anishinaabe Samiti and Jodhpur. What came to be called revolutionary terrorism or rev armed revolution. The British called it terrorism, but Indian writers called it the armed revolutionary movement. This it begins actually in and in the later part of the Indian of the Swadeshi movement. And the reason for that, why the other three don't succeed, even though you haven't asked me to, but since I brought up the point, one of the main reasons is the social divisions that exist in Bengal. Boycotts doesn't succeed. Why? Because most of the common people of Bengal are very poor and also they are largely Muslims, certainly in Eastern Bengal. So they naturally would like to buy foreign cloth, which is much cheaper than the cloth that is made in India. Not only cheaper, it is also of better quality. So they are not willing actually to work out. They, are, they want to sell that cloth, it's, a, it's, it's their source of livelihood and they are, they are both consumers as well as sellers of foreign cloth and they don't succumb easily to this call for boycott. As a result, what happens, a lot of coercion is used to enforce the boycott and that coercion was often burning of people's houses, uh, prohibiting them from any kind of social intercourse, you know, isolating them, treating them as, them as lepers and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of ostracization that is happening. That's the word I was looking for, including arson. And mm. this creates a division within the Swadeshi movement. Rabindra Tagore, for example, is not in favor of coercion at all. And he articulates his views in a novel that he wrote later, few years after Swadeshi, uh, very famous now because of Satyajit Ray's uh, cinematic representation of it, Ghore Baire, The Home and the World, where through the voice of one of the principal characters, Nikhilesh, which is supposed to be, and rightly, I believe, the voice of Tagore himself, the position that boycott cannot be coercive is articulated. So this is one reason why the boycott aspect of Swadeshi doesn't catch on, the coercion becomes more prominent and from coercion, you move to revolutionary, armed revolutionary activity. Yeah, and some really important characters 
you know, actually support that revolutionary. Uh, for example, Jugantar uh, Aurobindo Ghosh oh. actually. Yeah, so there are very important people who are supporting, uh, not only supporting, they are actually advoc advocates of this. Aurobindo yeah. Ghosh and his brother Barin Ghosh is certainly among, uh, uh, among the two of them. Uh, and there, as, there are two important groups that are formed the Onushilan Shomiti and the Jugantar group, Correct. who are Correct. the principal uh, organizers of these uh, violent activities, assassination attempts, bomb throwing attempts, and so on and so forth that take place in Bengal. The attempt on Hardinj, for example, yeah. uh, in, in which Rajbari Ghosh is involved, uh, not from Bengal, but he's there in Dehradun, but he, he actually is present uh, in Delhi when that uh, episode takes place. So th things like that. On We observed the anniversary of the hanging of Kudiram Bose on the 12th of August. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think it was 1908 or something like that. Uh, again, is a part of this movement, but you know, much of these movements, because these were 15, 16, 17 year old lads who had been fired by patriotism, that I must sacrifice, I must do something, even if it means sacrificing myself for the motherland. So Khudiram Bose is a martyr, but he didn't kill the person he was supposed to kill. He actually killed mistakenly because he didn't have the proper training. He hadn't been, you know, told properly what to do. He had just been told to hurl bombs at carriages. And the bomb he hurled, the carriage at which he hurled the bomb contained two innocent white ladies who died. Yeah. And the police commissioner for whom bombs were intended was in a different carriage. And the boy got hanged for the wrong, wrong, wrong reason. There used to be a very famous song in Bengal. This just emphasizes the point of sacrifice that I am, I just made. Akbar Bidai Dema Ghure Ashi. Just give me, allow me to say goodbye once. I will come back. Yeah. And this is the song that these young people actually sang when they were in the gallows. Just before the news tightened, this is the song that they sang. Yeah, in fact, there you are know, other I, I am not like going, I'm not going away. I'm not going away. This is not the final farewell. There's something very poignant in that. You know, I, I find this, this trend of Indian, the Indian national movement, particularly the early revolutionary phase, I find it very poignant, more than powerful, I find it very poignant that these young men, as I said, in their teens, sacrificing themselves, fired by patriotism, passion, sacrificing themselves for the cause of the mother. Yeah, so each time one of these episodes happen, like for example, the Kanayalal that uh, hanging in uh, Alipur uh, case, the assassination with Satyendranath uh, uh, Bose, I think suddenly galvanized the common man also. No? Uh, yeah, it the... captures the imagination. It yeah. captures the imagination of the people of Bengal and elsewhere as well. You know, so here are a group of people who are willing actually to die for the desh, mm. for the country. What am I doing? You know, it turns your gaze inwards. Uh, what am I doing? You yeah, know, and this yeah. is the mood of self-consciousness, self-questioning, if you like, on which Gandhi builds a different kind of movement. He yeah, actually, yeah. he captures this. After Jalian al he captures this pulse of the people. When the entire country is traumatized, rendered speechless, by what has happened in Jalian al and people are asking themselves this question, even though they're not articulating it, they're asking themselves a the question, what is happening to us? What is happening to our lives? What can we do? And it is this self-questioning that Gandhi 
captures in the non-cooperation movement by saying that British rule continues in its barbaric fashion because Indians cooperate with the British. Stop cooperating with the British. The British would be forced to leave. It is this, it's a, it takes a different route than the sacrifice in, on the, in the gallows, but the mood is the same. The capturing of the imagination, which I said, is the same in both cases. There's a distinct similarity there. Well, it's also interesting at this point that, uh, you know, at, at the, uh, around the time of the partition, there's also this great desire to vernacularize education. And that's a big, huge movement. The Dawn Society happens, National Council of Education happens in 1905. Eventually, Before Shantini Ketan happens. Ah, correct. Uh, Shanti Niketan happens and eventually Jadavpur University is set up as a counter to Calcutta University. Much the later, Edu National Council of Education morphs itself into the Jadavpur, into Jadavpur University. Wow. Right. So, so and similar things are happening elsewhere as well. I mean, we are focusing on Bengal because today we are talking about Bengal. But right. similar, similar movements of vernacularization or I would say similar movements to revive indigenous education, revive regional languages are also happening in different parts of India, particularly in Maharashtra. Yes. So there are two, three things I would like to touch before we start taking some questions. One is a quick comment about where are the women in all of this? So, uh, Women come in, in, in Bengal, at least in not openly into Indian nationalism in, in the initial phases, the phase that we have talked about, but in a different way. Kadumbini Ganguly, for example, defies all existing rules, traditions, etc. To become the first female doctor in India. Two of them become Chandramani Bose, I think that is the other person. I might getting might be getting Chandramani wrong, but it's certainly a Bose. So Kadambini Ganguly and Bose, they are the first two female doctors. Now, 1880s, huh? Now imagine what they are fighting against. So this is also a facet of resurgence, the facet of reassertion of identity that many of the women of the Tagore household, for example, yeah. are Shraddha Kumari Devi, you know, uh, are also involved in similar different kinds of ventures. So that's one thing that is happening on the cultural professional front, the breaking of shackles of patriarchy. But the political articulation of this, I think, comes in a very dramatic way only in the non-cooperation movement, when actually not hundreds, but thousands of women come out onto the streets, fill the jails at Gandhi's call of, of non-cooperation. But before that, even though they were not out on the streets during the Shodeshi period, women actually gave up their belongings, foreign belongings that they had when the call for Shodeshi came. Famous Shodeshi song, Phelaidao Reshmi Churi Bongo Nari Ar Poroma. So throw it away, your Reshmi jewelry, your Reshmi cloth. Bengal women don't wear it anymore. So they may not be out on the streets, but they are also sacrificing some of their cherished belongings they're giving away. This acquires a greater scale and magnitude in the non-cooperation movement when actually defying their husbands, defying their fathers, defying their brothers, women come out on the streets and respond to Gandhi's call to fill the jails. Okay, next one. 
there are some interesting personalities and often you know downplayed in our history books you know and uh, sorry there are some interesting personalities who are part of this and a uh, whole movement and who are you know often downplayed in our history books like rash bihari bose and uh, fascinating story of how he heads out of bengal gets to saranpur becomes you know so active in the uh, you know uh, actually lives in dehradun yes and then gets back to uh, chandranagar and then you know from there participates in the you know harding assassination attempt and then runs off to japan and actually becomes a japanese citizen can you talk yeah. a little bit more about him and he he raises what is the indian national army which yeah. then becomes of course it gets transformed in the hands of subhash bhut now i want to since you are talking about individuals and personalities not often mentioned rajgari bhut is certainly one of them you know even today there isn't a good biography of deshbandhu chitranjan das yes for the arrival of gandhi undoubtedly the most important all india congress leader yes the man who defended aurobindo bos aurobindo ghosh in the famous trial where he made the announcement in the presence of a british judge if love for my country is a crime i am a criminal yes okay and legend has it in calcutta i am and i have no reasons to doubt that legend that he actually gave away every he was a very prosperous barrister at law he actually gave away everything that he had to the indian national congress so nothing is written about it and very important very interesting uh, i was saying this to a group of school children yesterday that when subhash bose arrives in india from cambridge having resigned from the indian civil service or not taking the indian civil service even though it was offered offered to him and it was, he was ranked very high in the list he lands in bombay without collecting his luggage who does he go to see he goes to see gandhi because he has heard gandhi is in this is 1921 non cooperation movement in yeah. full bloom so because he's heard gandhi is in bombay he goes to see gandhi and that he describes it in the autobiography uh, you know he's the only man in a western dress as he enters this room gandhi is of course on sitting on the floor and but that chair is brought for him and he sits there and they have a two hour long conversation about india's freedom swaraj so on so forth and gandhi who what does gandhi what is gandhi that advice to subhash bhut he says you are from bengal you go back to bengal and work with deshbandhu chitranjan das yeah. he is he should be your leader become his lieutenant and that's what subhash does he goes to chitranjan das and he becomes his right hand so i think we need to we need to from bengal somebody from bengal should write it a very good biography objective biography there is no need to extol him or defy him a biography of chitranjan das one yeah, he also founded the swaraj party right swaraj party within the congress as did motilal nehru they yeah. were very close friends yeah, but i guess he died early so you know he died in 1926 by the way another anecdote how does nehru jawaharlal enter the world of politics the congress decides that the hunter commission report on jallianwala bag is a whitewash and they appoint their own inquiry commission the responsibility of that the head of that commission is cr das and cr das tells motilal he says you know i will do all that i will collect the testimony but i need somebody who can actually put all our findings into coherent lucid prose why don't you give me jawhar who has just come back from cambridge yeah. okay and that's how nehru goes with cr das to amritsar and punjab finds out drafts that report and 
that has a trans life transformative impact on impact on nerve so the other person again completely different strand not much is written about him is kalpana dot in chitta uh, yeah yeah the first time where the indian national flag is raised in chittagong yeah albeit albeit very briefly but it's a very significant moment in india's struggle for freedom i think we need need a much more manvi chatterjee has a book but i think we need a more detailed study of kalpana dot she was a charismatic figure she was beautiful she was courageous beyond words yes so i think we need to relook at some of these figures these are neglected figures unsung figures of the indian national movement but it's also interesting some specific cities created you know a much more interesting uh, you know bunch of people chittagong being one of them sillet calcutta chandranagar you know so dhaka it, also huh dhaka dhaka yeah. also yeah because anshilan samiti went there yeah. dhaka yeah. good i think now we can uh, just stop there there's so much in fact uh, one of the interesting little anecdotes is that uh, subhash chandra bose was introduced to rash bihari bose at the instance of savarkar yeah Yeah. Okay. Uh, then okay. There's one question here: is Why did Curzon shift the capital from Calcutta to New Delhi? Was it because of the failure of the partition? No. Uh, that is only a minor part of the reason. I think. the shift is actually because the british want to model themselves as an empire and what is the model the immediate model that is of relevance to them it is the mughal empire that ruled india from delhi and the british had been moving towards this after 1858 there are a series of darbars they actually call it darbar in the mughal using the mughal term using the mughal tradition in fact some of the etiquettes of the mughal darbar were actually followed in these darbar so they are trying to take over the the symbols of ruling india that they think they have inherited from the mughals because they are the next empire the next empire wallers if you like so when they think that's why they moved to delhi delhi and they discovered the symbolic importance of delhi through the events of 1857 when rebels initially flocked to delhi to bahadur shah a decrepit old man yes but this you are our leader it's your hindustan we are trying to defend against the firangi you know the british were quite stunned by by this development why this why harking back to the moguls and they realize that the mogul heritage the mogul legacy still has resonances and echoes in the imagination of the indians so they try to take over the mogul mantle and one of the ways they can take it over is to move their capital to delhi and build a capital which is actually not entirely in the british style they take over the architecture of the new cap of the new capital is a very subtle fusion of the mogul ways of building mogul architecture and british architecture together so all the central buildings in delhi except the bungalows are a mixture of this mogul and the british they did it very consciously now it's very clear from the private papers of latians and baker that it was a very conscious decision to fuse these two architectural styles so that's okay, the reason why they why they move it so there's another question here which is that uh, in nehru's cabinet the only bengali was shama prasad mukherjee and uh, 
why was that the case? So why didn't weren't there any other Bengalis that Nehru could think of? There weren't actually at that point of time there weren't any prominent Bengalis uh, who were had been members of the Constituent Assembly or were very prominent. So Shama Prashad was a very obvious choice, despite political differences that uh, Nehru had with Shama Prashad. I mean, the other member of the constituent, Bengali member of the constituent assembly was a communist, Shumnath Lahidi. I mean, uh, he, he couldn't choose a communist, I mean, a full-time member of the Communist Party of India, which was actually denying party, denying independence at that point of time by saying, ye azadi juti hai. So how yeah, could you make yeah. somebody a cabinet minister? And even if it was offered to Somnath Lahiri, I don't think the Communist Party would have arrived, allowed him to become a minister of Nehru's first cabinet. So Shyam Prashad is an obvious choice, very obvious choice. Yeah, and I think Just because Ambedkar is an obvi Ambedkar is an obvious choice, despite differences yeah. with uh, yeah. the Congress. He had opposed the Quit India movement, had been part of the Viceroy's Council in 1942, but he's uh, part of part of the cabinet. So I, I don't think these petty political differences and whether one is a Bengali or not a Bengali, I, didn't, I don't think these occurred to people who made the first, first cabinet. They saw themselves as Indians and not as Bengalis or Maharashtrians or things like that. Hmm. Though it is interesting that there were various uh, Congress, uh, you know, mo uh, uh, conventions and the, the Surat split happened then. Uh, Sorry, I can't hear you. The Surat split happened it kind of divided the Bengali group. Surat, down split, is Surat split is much earlier in 1916. Yeah, yeah, progressively. And I think the last nail was uh, 1939, the ejection of uh, Subhash. Subhash wasn't expelled from the Congress. Subhash yeah. left the Congress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1939. This is a very wrong impression people have that Shubash was expelled from the Congress. He wasn't. He left the Congress and yeah. formed his yeah. own political party, the All India Forward Bloc. Correct. Correct. Yeah, right. Okay. Then let me see what are the others. In Tagore's Ghare Baire, the Swadeshi movement is seen as a tool used by Indian politicians who further create div uh, division among Hindu and Muslims and perpetuated riots during the partition of India. How much truth does this hold? Not partition of India. The novel is written in 1915, so the partition of India is far away. Uh, what the novel reveals, and this I said this before, that most of the people who are leaders and are trying to enforce the boycott of foreign cloth are Hindus. And most of them come from the upper castes as well, and many of them are landlords. And the affected people, people who are affected by the boycott, both as consumers as well as sellers of foreign cloth, are lower, either of the lower caste or, most importantly, are poor Muslims. And this is what causes the riot. In in 1909, 1910, when is actually looked as situated, 1908, 1907, 1908, when it's situated, there is, there is a series of communal riots that are taking place, Hindu-Muslim riots that are taking place, in, particularly in East Bengal. And this is, the, this is the reason for those riots. This is actually mus, poor Muslims objecting to the coercion. So one other comment, uh, and I, uh, you know, so why the women were, uh, you know, not, why the women were not part of the, uh, you know, the, the revolutionary movements, you know, one of the comments being put here is that it, or uh, the uh, things like the initial Samiti were all from basically Akhadas, you know, the, which was a very male dominated. Oh, but women do become part of uh, the armed revolutionary movement, Bina Das. Yeah. Kalpuna Datta, yeah. you know, so, you know, in, in the Swadeshi period, maybe patriarchy, male domination was more prominent. But as I said, with Gandhi's uh, quote unquote, opening out politics and political activity across genders, in the armed revolutionary movement, also women become prominent. Pritilata Jawatar, Kalpuna Datta, Binadas, 
all these are women who are willing to sacrifice their lives as much as young men are willing to sacrifice their lives. Matungini Hazra, who is shot during 1942 in Midnapur, carrying yeah. the national yeah. flag. Yes. Right. So I think we're short, over short. Uh, I'll uh, close here. Uh, we'll record this. It will be up on the site. So anyone who uh, wants to see it later, most welcome. Uh, thank you, Professor Mukherjee. As always, just simply fascinating. Uh, thank you, you know, Paul, for giving me this chance. It's an absolute delight. Thank you very much from all of us here at Sarmaya. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you for all the audience for signing in and for those who are listening. Keep track. There's more coming. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Stay well. Yeah, stay well.